Hello again, boys and girls. Yesterday you watched a vodcast on the functions of the skeletal system. Tonight's lecture is going to concentrate on the structure of the bone. Some of the structures that are included in the bones are the periosteum, the compact bone, the spongy bone, the marrow, and the cartilage. So as we can see here, we have five different parts of the bone. The first part of the bone I'm going to discuss is called the periosteum. Periosteum, as you can see, is this thin layer that covers the outside of the bone. Another major function of the periosteum, though, other than being a tight covering around the bone structure, is that it allows for muscles to attach to the bone. So your muscles, when we talked about tendons last night, don't attach straight onto the bone. They actually attach to the periosteum. The next structure of the bone that we're going to talk about is compact bone. Compact bone is basically what it sounds like. It's the hard bone tissue that gives the bone strength and support. If we take a look at this picture of the bone again, the compact bone is the outer shell of the bone. So it's the hard surface of the bone you feel when you, when you have a bone in your hand. Now if we take a closer look at the compact bone, The structure of the bone will give us a reason as to why the bone is so solid. Now here you can see the compact bone. You have cells, bone cells called osteocytes that make up the compact bone and they sit inside these rings called lamellae. Lamellae are the mineral rings that help calcify and harden the bone to give the compact bone its sturdy structure. And running through the middle of these lamellae are haversian canals. And the haversian canals if you look at them closer, are just little entryways for blood vessels to enter. Arteries always take blood away from the heart and out to the body. So through the arteries that travel through these perversion canals, oxygenated blood, nutrients, water, and all the good stuff that our cells need travel through those tubes to get to the bone cells. The bone cells will release their wastes and they'll travel through the vein and the vein will bring the blood back to the heart. So that's what compact bone looks like. The third part of the bone that we're going to talk about is called spongy bone. And spongy bone is a tissue with tiny spaces that makes the bone very lightweight and flexible. So an easy way to remember what spongy bone looks like is remember your favorite cartoon character, SpongeBob SquarePants. He's a sponge. As all sponges have, SpongeBob is filled with a lot of holes, just like your kitchen sponge. So remember, the spongy bone inside of the bone has a lot of open spaces. So if we zoom back out again, we can see that underneath the compact bone, we have a layer of spongy bone. Being that there are so many air spaces in the spongy bone, and there's no bone tissue filling that space, this makes the bone a little lighter in weight. If we had 100% compact bone making up our entire bone, then our bone structures would be extremely heavy. We'd be very heavy in weight. We'd be very slow to move. It could be very cumbersome on our bodies. In addition, this spongy bone allows for flexibility in the bone so they can bend but not break. All right, the next part of the bone that I'm going to discuss is bone marrow. Now, bone marrow comes in two varieties. We have what's called red marrow. Red marrow is the marrow tissue inside of the bone that produces red blood cells. So that's pretty easy to remember what red marrow does because it makes red blood cells. If you've ever finished eating a chicken wing, you notice in the middle of those bones you'll have a brown-like substance. That brown-like substance is the red marrow except that it's been cooked. So that's the bone marrow. And this is how bone marrow produces red blood cells. In humans, bone marrow is found in the interior of several bones, such as the femur. Red bone marrow is found within a network of hard, spongy bone nestled within compact bone. Beneath the red bone marrow along the shaft of long bones is yellow bone marrow. Yellow bone marrow is mostly made of fat and serves as an energy reserve. Contained within the red bone marrow are stem cells that give rise to several different types of blood cells, including red blood cells. Red blood cells stay in the bone marrow until they are mature. They are then transported from the marrow into the circulatory system by adjoining blood vessels and from there to all parts of the body. 
Okay, so as the video said, there is a second type of bone marrow tissue inside of our bones, and that is called yellow marrow. And yellow marrow stores fat. That's an easy way to remember because usually fatty tissue is yellowish in color, in some shade of yellow, whether it's a darker yellow. If you're wondering if that's true, if you've ever seen earwax before, earwax has that yellowish color to it because it's a lipid, which is a fat that we talked about earlier this year. And in addition to that, fat is also used as a backup energy source. Fat's a very high yielding energy molecule, however, it does take more energy to break it down than the energy it takes to break down glucose. And now the fifth and final structure we're going to talk about is cartilage. Now cartilage is a slippery smooth tissue that's found at the end of the bones. It's an extremely unique and fascinating tissue to have. There hasn't been anything made by humans that can replicate the efficiency or the effectiveness of cartilage. So cartilage plays two great roles. It acts as a friction reducer, so we don't have as much friction between the bones when we move, and it also acts as a shock absorber. So if we take a look at this diagram of the knee here, you'll see on the left a healthy knee joint. At the end of your femur and at the top of your tibia, you have this white material. This white material is the cartilage. So as you can tell, the cartilage is placed in different areas where the bones are going to meet. As you can see by looking at the diagram, the bottom of the femur has two processes that come out and they kind of sit in small depressions in the tibia, which is your shin bone. So the cartilage in those areas will rub up against each other whenever you bend your knee as you're walking or as you're running. You won't have that bone-on-bone -bone grinding action irritating the bone and breaking down the bone. However, there are disorders that do attack the cartilage and such a disorder is called arthritis. Arthritis occurs in a person when the actual cartilage between the bones starts to deteriorate. Now one can have rheumatoid arthritis which is where the immune system attacks and destroys a person's own cartilage or you can have what's called osteoarthritis here as you can see in the picture where you have some irritation of the bone causing these bone spurs to form and as a result of these lumpy bone spurs this once even and smooth surface as you can see on the left is no longer that way on the right and it helps facilitate the destruction of the cartilage and once that cartilage is gone again you're gonna have the bones grinding on top of one another irritating one another and cause severe pain and lastly cartilage also acts as a shock absorber so if you take a look at the diagram again on the left the healthy knee joint imagine you're playing basketball or volleyball and you jump up to grab a rebound or you jump up to spike a ball when you land on your feet all that force of your body weight and gravity slamming into the bottom of your feet is going to be transferred up through your entire body. So the reason why it doesn't hurt as much is because the cartilage within our joints, as you can see here in the knee, will act as a cushion to absorb some of that force. And this will help on the wear and tear of the knee and make jumping a little more comfortable. So let's take a look at a video clip from the human body pushing the limits. And we're going to watch some hardcore parkour guys running around town doing their jumps and flips and how important cartilage is to them. But every day, every hour, our bones have to handle huge forces. They take a hammering from normal life. To survive, the human skeleton has evolved a material so strong that no technology can match it. These street gymnasts are among the world leaders at free run. A sport that tests the body's flexibility to its limits. And it's only possible because our legs have high performance shock absorbers. Running puts a strain on our legs three times our body weight. A jump can put the skeleton under stress equal to 10 times body weight. But the body has ways to handle such forces. On landing, leg muscles absorb energy, like giant elastic bands, so we don't simply collapse. 
The real key to withstanding shock is human engineering that modern technology can't match. Our knees. The knee bones are connected by ligaments, lengths of fibrous tissue that crisscross. As the joint flexes, they stretch. But ligaments are twice as tough as nylon rope, with a combined breaking strain of nearly a ton. At the joint's core, between the two bones, is a remarkable material. Cartilage, a mere fraction of an inch thick. It absorbs the impact's full force. Cartilage shapes the nose and ears and is made of collagen. But in our joints, cartilage has remarkable properties. A weave of collagen fibers is surrounded by 80% water. On impact, it acts like a water-filled cushion. Knee cartilage is so strong, it can bear seven tons before it gives way. What's more, on the pad surface, collagen fibers are uniquely arranged to make it almost frictionless. The knee bones roll over one another like well-oiled bearings. In a lifetime, hundreds of millions of shocks pass through this tiny area, a uniquely durable design. Welcome back, boys and girls. This is going to conclude our lesson on the five structures of the bone. Thank you.